a test. It was very simple. He said that if you can have a conversation with it and believe it to be human, then it must have some kind of intelligence. He even scripted an example of the kind of intelligent chats that might occur. In the first line of your sonnet, which reads, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Would not a spring day do as well or better? It wouldn't scan. How about a winter's day? That would scan all right. Yes, but nobody wants to be compared to a winter's day. Would you say that Mr Pickwick reminded you of Christmas? In a way. Yet Christmas is a winter's day and I don't think that Mr Pickwick would mind the comparison. I don't think you're serious. By a winter's day, one means a typical winter's day, rather than a special one like Christmas. <laughs> In 1950, Turing predicted that within a hundred years, we'd be able to have a conversation like that on any subject with a machine. However, there are those who say we can do it now, 50 years early. This is what they're talking about. This is Ella. Don't be fooled by the picture. She's a machine, and I'm supposed to be able to have a conversation with her. So let's give it a try. Uh, what's she saying here? Hello, my name's Ella. Nice to meet you. Please tell me what name I should call you. Jeremy, say, does being a man pay well? Do you like cheese? I'm not so excited about cheese, a little is OK. I saw the Doobie Brothers there. How did it look to you? Well, it looked, they look. You've never heard of the Doobie Brothers, have you? What's heard of the Doobie Brothers like? <laughs> you don't even know where to put apostrophes. She's intelligent in the same way that I think my dog's intelligent. Who, what, where, why, hen, how, you should be a newspaper reporter. Again, let me change the subject a little. Mm, she doesn't know, does she? Unimpressed with Ella, my search for artificial intelligence took me to County Hall in London, where they've built some electronic dogs that can play that most cerebral of games, football. The dogs are in training for the Robot World Cup, Robo Cup. The team from Essex University, the Essex Rovers, are being put through their paces by Doctor Who. No, really. We have to train our dogs to play football. Each dog should be able to find the ball, approach the ball, kick the ball into the goal. The dogs are in fact displaying a kind of intelligence. No one is controlling them. The idea is that once they're on the pitch, they make their own decisions. On top of that is team skill. Because we have four dogs in the same team. Doctor Who's team, Matthew, Dave and Bo, are up against it. We have less than two days really to finish everything up and have a full team playing. So, are the boys going to get a result in the Robo Cup? The teams we're most scared of are the Americans and the Germans. Especially Germany. <laughs> Concerned. But uh, we have to use our brain how to actually score the goal against the German team. I can only say it's fingers crossed. Padua University in northern Italy is hosting RoboCup this year. The fearsome pizza-eating Americans and the utterly terrifying, far too busy for pizza Germans are already in place. The Essex Rovers are late, and there's a problem. Um, we have four blind dogs, one of them's which the legs are not working. It, um, it's like trying to get Colchester to play up against Real Madrid. 
The idea behind RoboCup is that by 2050, a team of robots will be able to beat the human World Cup champions. Already, two-legged robots are being developed ready for the challenge, and many are said to be cleverer than their human counterparts. Sadly, though, Doctor Who and the boys are forced to throw in the towel. Broken dogs just don't cut it in the Robo Premiership. But it's not all about football. RoboCup is also an opportunity for robotic engineers to meet other robotic engineers and get emotional. I need to go sleep. It was very, very good. So is this really the best that the artificial intelligence people can come up with? A vacuum cleaner that's confused by tables and a dog that Let's go for a walk. Shut up. A dog that's so bad at football, even I can tackle it. What? Please help me. <laughs> Please help me. One of the AI community's leading lights is Professor Kevin Warwick. Well, this is a robot head. Dissatisfied with vacuum cleaners and robot dogs, Kevin's gone one stage further. His cyborg comes complete with... Radar in its nose and an infrared top lip. Is it intelligent? Well, in a very limited way, I guess it is. It is it's sort of a basic instinct. What do I do with this information that I'm getting? How do I move? Uh, how do I operate if this signal is different? So what's it doing now? Well, if you clap your hands... Oi, over here. Oh, it did it. It's making basic decisions. All we've got it, all we've got it doing here is programmed to make basic decisions based on that sensory information that's coming in. Getting the information in is nothing. That's like picking up a book. That's not an intelligent thing to do. Reading the book and knowing what the words mean, that's surely the intelligence. Many machines can read books nowadays, but it may be it means something different electronically to the machine as it would mean to a human. Though the cyborg head does a reasonable job of sensing, it can't really interact with or explore its surroundings. It's fastened to its robot arm. And according to Kevin, it's only as intelligent as a dishwasher. If, if that's a dishwasher... Yes. Wh where are these in terms oh. of... Are they dolphins, chimps? I, I think you'd have to say uh, it's about the 50 to 100 brain cell area. So, realistically, you're talking slugs and snails. So but a slug and a snail, they know to eat. They know these things well, don't... They have, they have some innate abilities. There's it's no self-preservation with that. Well, we do have. This, this, the power supply, they don't have their own batteries. They each have power they're picking up from the floor here. Well, that's where they're getting their, their energy. That's where they're getting yeah. their food But from. if you turned off this section of the, of the, of the floor... If we turn off this section, was here, they have a basic instinct to go and look for some power somewhere they else. Do they have will that. keep going to do that until they find some. So if I put him down... It should go off looking. So he'll have to go and look for power. Yeah. And it, I ought to tell him to do that. No, it's, it's an innate response for that robot. It's a basic Self -preservation. thing of his life. Yeah, yeah. Now, his, his lights have come back on. Lights have come on. So, so hope, he's found power. he's happy over. now that he's getting power away to go. But these, then, are as intelligent as slugs. It, it's different. But in terms of numbers of brain cells and that sort of thing, yeah, we have slugs. Probably you could say we're up to bees and wasps, the sort of tens of thousands of brain cells, is about as good as you can get at the, at the moment. At the moment. In 2004, yeah. bees and wasps. Yeah. Right. It might be bees and wasps today, but Kevin has seen the future. He's convinced that the way forward for the human race is much more closely linked to machines than most of us would imagine. So one day, he went to hospital and had a plug socket surgically implanted in his wrist. 
What was the point of turning yourself into a human cyborg? Well, it was looking at the